Hi, I'm Daniel Nyman. On behalf of the Forum for Healthcare Strategists, as well as our colleagues at YEXT, welcome and thank you for joining us for improving SEO and patient acquisition with the Headless CMS. Today's webinar focuses on a topic of critical importance for healthcare executives, how to create a better experience for the healthcare consumer. We'll explore how Beacon Health used a headless CMS approach to do just that and found success in everything from SEO to appointment scheduling in the process. Here to share Beacon Health's journey are Matt Clawwitter, Senior Digital Access Strategist at Beacon Health, and Carrie Lichen, Head of Industry for Healthcare at Yext. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, one quick note. Attendees are participating in listen-only mode, but you can still ask questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the question and answer pane located on the bottom of your screen at any time. We'll respond to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. With that, I'll turn the program over to Carrie to kick us off. Carrie? Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today with Matt. We're happy to be talking about um, very interesting changes in technology. And I think Matt and the team at Beacon Health have done some very, very, very progressive things uh, just with data and with combining pieces of data and really embodying the concept of the headless CMS. So I am going to be controlling the slides here and I'll start with my introduction and then I'll pass it off to Matt for his introduction. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carrie Lykin. I am the head of industry for Healthcare at Yext. I've been at Yext for seven years where I've led product strategy and go to market for our healthcare business. When I joined, we had one healthcare customer. And when uh, I look at our customer base now, we have over 500. And I'm really excited because I feel like our technology has done a lot to help improve the patient experience as well as make lives easier for healthcare organizations. I uh, spent eight and a half years at Google prior to that. I have a little bit of knowledge of SEO, but when we're talking about SEO today, I'm relying a lot on our uh, head of SEO here at Yext, his experience and what he's taught me and how that marries uh, with healthcare, but also with our technology and then what Matt has been able to do uh, to leverage all of that. So I'll turn over the mic to Matt uh, so that you can do your own introduction. Thanks, Gary. I see this slide and I'm like, gosh, I need to get a haircut. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Happy to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, looking forward to talking about the, the work that we've done in partnership uh, with Yext and some of the innovations uh, that we've made and, and really speak about the, the team at Beacon and, and some of the accomplishments that we've had in this area. So looking forward to, to sharing more uh, later on. And, and thank you, Carrie, for the introduction. Well, here we go. So why are we here? And why are we looking at all of these logos on this slide? Basically, we're here because all of these different organizations have completely changed the expectations of what people are experiencing digitally. So patients are consumers and consumers have been trained most especially during the pandemic and by all of these digital organizations that we see here plus others, to expect instantaneous things, to expect convenience, to expect just a really ease of use. And then in November, when ChatGPT and conversational AI became mainstream, patients and consumers will now have even higher expectations from their digital experiences. And we definitely believe that digital will become a conversation rather than just an online brochure. So what we're seeing here, though, is a pair of shoes. And I like to always say that when I'm looking at this pair of shoes and when I'm talking to healthcare organizations, I like to say it's important to actually put yourself in the patient or the consumer's shoes and walk miles and miles and miles in them. And because all of these expectations have been elevated from all of those other logos and those other companies that we shared on the slide before, we think about actually how it feels to be a consumer, how it feels to be a patient within the healthcare perspective. It's actually pretty, pretty difficult these days. And so a lot of times, I can give you a personal example. A lot of times if you're searching uh, for uh, care and I've been searching for the last 11 months for a dermatologist at MGH. I haven't been able to find one because every time I'm doing it digitally, it comes up to clicking on trying to book an appointment or making a phone call. It clicks over to a 404 not found. My husband works for MGH and he said, you know, Carrie, 
I can help you get an appointment with the doctor. And I feel like a lot of people who are working within healthcare organizations have what I call the bat phone. My husband is my bat phone. It's an instant, easy way of being able to say, can you help me get this? And he'll make a recommendation or he'll send an email to someone he knows within the system. And I can easily get in through the bat phone or the back door. But most patients and consumers can't do that. And so if organizationally, we're not actually walking in their shoes and really understanding where the broken points and where the experience challenges, where they're falling short, whether it's in parking all the way through to the digital experience or online appointment scheduling, or even finding information to begin with just to do some research. That's where we have the biggest opportunity to make big changes. So walking a mile in the shoes and doing it regularly is really important to do so. And it's really hard to think about just how big of a project that could be to actually walk miles and miles in a patient's shoes. But I think it's actually pretty easy when we think about what's a good first place to start. A good first place to start is actually on search engines. And Matt and I have talked about this a billion times about how the whole concept of the digital front door and that term digital front door is sort of like, oh, I don't like it, but everyone's using it. And when we think about what the digital front door actually looks like, it's Google and other search engines, but it's basically Google. So to walk a mile in the patient or the consumer's shoes really could just start by making some improvements on that digital experience. And what does that look like? That's the Google experience. So let's just look at the numbers. We know that there are 1 billion healthcare searches a year on Google. There are 70,000 healthcare searches per minute on Google, and that 7% of all searches on Google are healthcare or healthcare related. So there are significant numbers of people who are looking for healthcare information just on Google alone. And that's just Google, not including other search engines like Bing and other places where people could be finding information. But that's not the end of it, because yes, the Google experience is very important, but then we have these other considerations of how fast technology is moving. And I mentioned this before, but the conversational AI piece is actually a really big deal too. So November launched, uh, OpenAI launched ChatGPT and basically said, now we can have a back and forth with a machine. And so conversational AI became something that, I mean, it was the fastest growing, fastest adopted technology to date in the history of humankind. And we're seeing that there are different use cases for how people are using conversational AI versus how they're using search. And then when we think about, well, what could be next? So much could be next. So we don't even know what we don't know. And so we think about conversational AI a little bit differently than search. ChatGPT, BARD, and others, they are set and they are great, useful cases for conversation, for research, for exploration. For search, like for Google, we think about Google, Bing, and others to, again, also do research, but also to transact or to convert. So there are these two basic use cases where now your data could potentially show or could feed into where information actually could surface in front of a patient or consumer. And recently, uh, this is from a TechCrunch article, OpenAI said that they're now going to be connecting ChatGPT to the internet. So when we think about websites and we think about where information is surfacing for a website, it used to just be search engines. So you used to have, for example, a CMS and that CMS would push information to the internet. But now what if it starts to push it to conversational AI platforms like ChatGPT? What if it does it to other platforms because people will follow suit and they will start to copy what OpenAI is doing? Now we need to be thinking about a website that is not just set for going to search, but set for showing up on all of these different places where information could be discovered and where patients and consumers have that ability to actually look and converse and research and explore. So we call these omni-channel digital experiences and Consumers are interacting with so many different platforms today, and they're all over the digital ecosystem. Literally, people might find information on search. They might find it on conversational AI platforms. They might do it through chatbots. They might want to talk through a phone call. They might also want to make sure that they're getting some information via voice assistance. And it's becoming harder and harder for organizations to actually say, how do I manage this? I have data in one place, but now do I have to duplicate it in another platform in order to service it because I want to use another technology or another uh, platform to be able to service it on a chatbot? 
it just becomes unwieldy. Even when I think about just social, you have TikTok and you have Instagram and you might have Snapchat and you might have LinkedIn. You have all of these different social uh, platforms. How do you get all of your information out there when it's tweaked just so that it's just right for each one of those different platforms so it doesn't look like you just copied and pasted, copied and pasted, copied and pasted? Same is true for all of these other platforms where people are finding information. So what we are seeing is that legacy architecture, so where the uh, platforms have been succeeding and how they have been built for, I would say, yesterday and maybe a little bit today, that architecture can't really deliver the consumer-grade digital experiences that we're now starting to expect. So legacy architecture is definitely just one big monolithic piece of software. It's proprietary. A lot of times you can't really even API into things. It's very limited to web and mobile experiences. Many times it's not optimized for AI. It's usually just a CMS, one channel. It tends to have bad search. Pages have bad and slow page speed. And it's really like legacy architecture is basically just built for a website. And what we used to say is digital brochures were the print experiences of your and then websites were built to take a digital, oh, sorry, to take a, um, a paper brochure and then convert that paper brochure into a digital experience. And now we need to start thinking about what's the evolution of that digital experience. That digital experience can't just be that online version of a brochure anymore. It really does have to be a, an opportunity to send data to so many different places. So the new architecture is much more in line with this concept of composable. You can put bits and pieces together. You can basically say, if I want the best online appointment scheduling platform, I can take what I have out and I can just insert the online scheduling platform that I want to use right in there. I can connect via APIs. I can utilize open source programming languages. I can then also think about web, mobile, third-party servicing. I can think about AI. How does AI generate content for me, but also how does AI understand search queries and other elements of just making sure that I'm ahead of the game. It's headless, which is what we're going to talk about um, a little bit more today. And then you have fast page speeds and there's this whole concept of building for the conversational future. We're going to be having conversations more with technology as well as with search engines. So how do we think about this new architecture? So defining headless, I think is uh, interesting. And I feel like I have these, and I feel like Matt can talk a little bit about this too, but. I've heard this in the industry. I talked to a lot of organizations and some have heard of headless CMS platforms and then others have said, we were, we were giving a presentation two weeks ago and the organization said, I don't understand what you mean by headless. So we'll level set here. Basically, when we think about headless, we think about a, 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 an opportunity to store data. And that opportunity to store data is the place where that data lives but then you have the opportunity to connect via API. You can connect to all of these different points um, where people are discovering it and they're detached from one another. So it means that, like I was saying before, if you have a mobile platform and you wanna surface data on that mobile experience and you say, this mobile experience isn't doing so great. I'm going to take that mobile experience out and I'm going to put a better one in. You can do that because your data actually lives separate from that mobile experience. When we think about, let's say, um, websites, if you say, oh, my, my page speeds aren't great, or I don't have the opportunity to actually pull together all of the data that I want to pull together to service it, you can actually take that out and you can put in a different uh, organization who might help you with the, um, the, the sites or the pages themselves. Same thing with chat, same thing with email. You could even use your data that lives separate from your presentation layer. You can use that data if you want. You can pull it out, you can extract it, and you can use it in print ads if you want. So this gives you a lot of flexibility and it's hence called sort of headless because there's the body and then there's the, uh, the ability to, uh, to have the head and you can separate the two. I don't know, Matt, if you want to uh, elaborate any more, but uh, this is sort of the, the basic definition as we're evolving as an industry. All good? Okay, so I talk a lot about this, but then what we're really wanting to talk about is the SEO component. And so Google and other search engines are still extremely important. And so we need to think about the SEO piece of how can you make sure that the content that you have that is living in a platform, how do you make sure that it actually gets out there and is done so in a way that can improve your patient volumes, can improve your appointments, 
uh, booked can improve discoverability across the board. And so there are these two components of this. There's EAT and then there's structured data. But SEO is sort of like, it's the big mystery. And so this is why it's such a mystery. It's because so many different elements come into SEO and so many different data points uh, impact SEO. So we have listings data, and then we have pages that are highly performant. We have content, you have reviews, and whether you're responding to your reviews. And so EAT is the top here, and then the relevance, distance, and prominence really impacts the local SEO. So what is EAT? So EAT is a, it, it represents three different things. It represents expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Expertise is what are you doing with your content? Is it high quality? And is it actually sourced from experts? Secondly, authoritativeness is, is your content authoritative? Are you the authority on the subject? This is pretty easy for healthcare organizations because healthcare organizations have great authority over that content that could live on the site. And then finally, the trustworthiness is, can you trust the content that is being put out there into the search engines because it's coming from a reputable source? And so when we think about eat, all of this has to actually exist in a place. You have to store it in a place, but then you have to be able to deliver it so that the search engines are reading it and understanding that you are an expert, you are authoritative, and you are trustworthy so that they will go ahead and contribute to basically all of this mess that is part of SEO. The second piece is the structured data piece. And this is where I think a lot of the, the concept of this headless CMS comes into play because structuring the data and then being able to send that data to places where it's discovered is becoming far more important to search engines. And so what does structured data actually mean? It just means that you have all of your data points, anything that people could be searching for or trying to discover, you have all of that that lives in one place, but now you're starting to build relationships among those data points or among those entities. So it's basically a relational database. And once you're able to build those relationships and then share that information externally with search engines, and many times sharing it means doing so through schema markup language on pages, you're basically spoon feeding Google and other search engines and saying, this is related to this, and this is related to that. So this doctor works in this location and is this specialist and performs these pr procedures and is only seeing patients on these days. So now you have an opportunity to have all of these relationships that you are telling Google and other search engines, and then in the future, conversational AI, you are telling them that this is how you need to be, uh, and you are the authority on it, but also you've structured the data in a way so that you can say, this is accurate. So this will then, like I said before, become very important to the conversational AI platforms, because they're starting to pull the data from the internet. So you're not only just using a CMS at this point, just to say, build me a website. You're now saying, I have the data, it's living in a platform, I'm sending it to search engines, but maybe now I'm going to send it to conversational AI platforms, but now maybe I'll send it to a chatbot, maybe I'll send it to a voice device. Like there's so many different places where now these relationships will become far more important. Your relationships really should look like this. If you think about it, think about structuring your data in a way where you know your providers, where your providers work, what your providers specialize in, even your conditions. Do you have content around your conditions? Can you create new content around conditions? Do you know the procedures that are associated with the conditions? So you can start to build a map that sort of looks like this. So how do you structure your data? You really could think about where do you store it today? And do you have the capability to build relationships among your different entities? Do you have providers? Are they associated with their specialties? Are they associated with conditions? Are they associated with articles and blog posts that you have about conditions? Like where does all of that live? Then how do you distribute your content today? So if you have a CMS, can you actually distribute content to 17 different places? Yes or no? If not, then maybe you start thinking about maybe moving toward a headless concept. And then what if something new comes up? I mean, in October, there really wasn't ChatGPT. And then November, there was ChatGPT. And then 100 million users later, uh, literally blink of an eye overnight. So are you able to say, I can quickly sync new data sources or new platforms because they came together? Because it's now, it's the next new thing. So that is uh, the, the overview. And I want to turn it over to Matt now, because what I was really excited about when Matt and I talked uh, last summer about what he's been doing at Beacon Health is that he said, 
you know, I had this idea and I had this thought and I said, how can I leverage structured data and how can I actually see if this will improve not only my SEO, but actually improve appointments. And so he and I walked through this together and I was blown away and I said, we have to capture this and we have to talk about it. And I would love for you to share this with the industry because it is a unique way of looking at things. So Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you and I would love for you to share all the great things that you're doing at Beacon Health. Thanks, Carrie. That was great. Uh, Carrie is very flattering and I appreciate it. And I, I also want to say that I, I'm a member of a team uh, that has worked on this and uh, what a collaboration this has been at Beacon uh, to be able to talk about this. And uh, I see many familiar names from Beacon who are on the call, and I just want to uh, give a shout out to them and, and let them know uh, how awesome it was to be able to do this and be a part of it and, and to represent the team here. So, uh, yeah, how how did we do it? <laughs> Every time, Carrie, I watch your presentation or if I'm, I'm partnering with you, I, I learn something new. Uh, and even in preparation for this presentation, uh, the team uh, the, of, of which I'm a part, we were talking this morning about uh, preparing for next generation of this and talking about what's next. So it's really helpful for us as well to, to talk about how we did it. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So what did we achieve? So just some background uh, in, in case you're not, uh, if, in case you're hearing about Beacon for the first time, uh, we are the first organization in Indiana uh, to be selected as a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can uh, Google it and, and find out more information about what that means. Uh, but it's a, it's a collaboration, a clinical collaboration uh, between the Mayo Clinic and independent healthcare organizations such as Beacon Health System. Uh, and the, it's, it's you know, across the globe. Uh, through this network, we have access to uh, doctors and specialists uh, to, be able to, share, to be able to share opinions, uh, to collaborate. Uh, and then we also have a lot of resources and access to uh, content and, and much more. What we're going to talk about today is the much more. We're not going to talk about the clinical side, uh, but we're going to talk about the, the other resources. Perfect. So as Carrie laid out in the, in the beginning, uh, this is how we did eat. This is how we uh, saw the opportunity uh, of the team uh, at Beacon uh, to execute this, to really think about what is an opportunity for us to um, put data first, uh, to look at composable data, to really talk about how could we be headless or even a hybrid headless? Uh, where were we going to get that, that structured data? Uh, and this is where we did it. So obviously, when we're talking about you know expertise and authority, I think there's no other uh, you know organization in the world that is as good as uh, Mayo for this. And, and with that partnership, we get access to their clinical health information. So it's a library of content available to any of its members. Uh, it's all online. It's evidence based, uh, and it's rooted in their clinical practice and research. It's based on 150 years of their operation. 11,500 pieces of content come with this, which is tremendous. It's all types of media, different uh, types of uh, content that we're going to look at in various formats. And here's the key. This is, as Carrie was talking about, and this is why it's essential. Uh, it's all delivered via API. And we're going to talk a little bit and I'll show you how that functions. Uh, we get analytics and we get... Uh, really great opportunities to leverage this content and show, uh, show our, our patients and our, our visitors uh, that expertise and authority. Great, okay. So here was a hypothesis and, and Carrie, you know, I, we talk about, we've talked about this for a long time. It seems like just yesterday we were having this conversation, um, but this was our hypothesis. So, uh, there was a group of us uh, at Beacon, uh, it seems like just yesterday, but we talked about how could we uh, deploy in each strategy with a knowledge graph that would generate appointments. So we didn't just want to put content on a page and hope that it converted you know, uh, a consumer or someone who's looking at choice or looking at healthcare options 
uh, that it wouldn't just be there for them to, to read, that it would actually convert them into an appointment. Our website exists at Beacon for many reasons, but number one is to generate appointments. It's for access. It's for people to be able to get an appointment. Uh, and so for us to be able to do that, we have to acquire patients, we have to deploy SEO tactics, and we have to have a robust knowledge graph that's going to be able to capture that traffic, that acquisition, and convert them into appointments. So we wanted to increase traffic. We wanted to find out if we could match a condition with a provider, figure out you know, uh, treatments and other procedures and really help connect that consumer to that content and really convert them into a patient. So how did we test and learn this? Here's kind of the timeline for those who are interested in how long does this take or how long did it take you uh, in particular? Uh, Gosh, back in April 2020, that's when we first started working with the Mayo Content API. Uh, our team had not previously worked on, with an API, so this was the first time that we were experimenting with structured content that was coming from an outside source. Uh, we did have a CMS where we were doing our own internal content management, but this was you know, an opportunity to, to utilize an API and start our first little baby step into headless. Uh, we saw page views go up, you know, huge. I mean, you put Mayo content, you put 11,000 pieces of content on your site. Google's going to like you. They're going to give you blue links. They're going to give you conversions. Uh, but that's where it was kind of stopping. And we weren't seeing a conversion of that to appointments. So very quickly from then we realized, okay, much like what Carrie was presenting and, and utilizing the, the Yex platform and our knowledge graph, we started and you know adding in and testing, putting providers on those pages. Uh, and even then we were seeing it was very difficult for us to do that because we were trying to match providers with content and it was hard to make those connections. So in April, we decided to go fully headless with this. We, we partnered uh, with Yex on this and we hired a senior web developer. We added to our API team. Uh, we advanced our training. We did a complete re recoding uh, and integrated the, in the entire Mayo Clinic library into a knowledge graph. And we used AI and natural language processing to find holes where matches didn't exist. And uh, so we'll go to the next slide. So that was the timeline. So here's our strategy. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, we're talking about gastritis in this particular example. Uh, you know, our strategy was to deploy a knowledge graph to in, improve the search experience. We knew that that content, that expertise coming from, from the Mayo Clinic would do that. Uh, we wanted to match providers on all pages. You know, we, we don't have the time or mission objective to go and put all the potential keywords for every particular treatment or condition into a database and then try to list all the names of all the people within our system. And we're a pretty large system uh, in our region to try to do that manually. So we decided to use structured content for locations and listings and services and providers uh, to be able to do those associations in a headless way where the APIs were making, were delivering content the Knowledge Graph was in making those connections. And you can see that this increase, you know, we were going to increase our calls to action. Uh, we wanted to get analytics on this and build new web pages and APIs that were equipped with natural language processing, faster load times. Uh, they're headless, and we could embed providers and put those providers on the pages right next to the great content. Okay. So here's the results, and I'm, I'm trying to move through this quickly so we could get to Q&A. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the numbers here. You can see the percentage increases. Since we added the knowledge graph, since we changed uh, and pivoted our strategy from it being just putting content on the page to making them truly headless, and all of the Mayo content, Mayo Clinic Health Library content is truly headless, uh, we started to see in the analytics and in our conversion rate optimizations in our studies, uh, appointment initiations really went up. I mean, we're talking large increases. 
our funnel conversion. So we we track a customer journey all the way from Google search or any sort of source medium campaign, right? We all know those. Um, our funnel conversions increased 79% for online bookable appointments. Traffic in our region, because we are a regional health system, uh, went up considerably in Indiana and in Michigan and in very significantly in Illinois. We're not too far geographically from Chicago, very hard to compete. So you can see that that was, that was a really great increase for us. Our engagement rates really continue to improve. You can see that's listed here in the yellow. Uh, you know, we, we want to get in the 60s and 70s, and you can see our engagement rates are going up. And we, we, we track those deltas to see what content, you know, strep throat, that's, you know, number one, and it, it has been number one for a long time. Um, how engaged are our users with that content? And is that really converting into appointments? Are we connecting people with uh, that content to the, the appropriate care? And then our search engine results are obviously up as well. And here's another graph. Uh, you can see examples I will look at this quickly. We track 30 day growth comparisons. We make sure that our curve is always, you know, uh, going in the, in the proper direction that we're improving. We're looking at engagement. We're looking at, and you can see uh, in that graph, these are individual providers and what content they're being associated with, how we got that content, how we sourced that, that particular user and did they convert. It's very easy for all of us in our team across marketing, comms, and digital to look at these reports and come up with a common purpose and talk about, is this an opportunity for us to market? Is this an opportunity for us to cultivate? Uh, and you can see that. You can see the results there. Matt, there's a question that came in that um, we've actually talked about before about duplicate content. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like you took a, a particularly important strategy with respect to that. So duplicate content, meaning? Uh, the question is that the subscription content when recognized as duplicative, wouldn't it eventually be matched to Mayo as primary source? Oh, and right. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We've talked a lot about this, so I would love for you to. Yeah, yeah. So obviously this is content that's being delivered by Mayo and Mayo is the, is the author. Uh, we make sure working with their team uh, and, and with our team that we have a canonical reference that shows and signals to Google and other search engines that Mayo is the author of this content. Uh, if you're interested in this and making sure that, uh, that your, your website um, conforms to this as well, uh, just Google canonical uh, SEO. All of this content recognizes when all of our pages recognizes that um, Mayo is the source. Um, and then we are delivering this and essentially is a way for us to make sure that we are not competing with Mayo uh, and that we have the proper relationship and Google respects that. Canonical also does give you value because it is, if it is um, utilized in this way, it gives us uh, sort of a halo effect, a, a, a connection with another authority, um, and it actually does boost uh, boost our SEO. Uh, this works so well for us, even this is sort of a personal story. Uh, based on the nature of the work that we do, we, I see a lot of healthcare information, a lot of treatment and diagnoses. I've gotten down to, I've gotten to the point now where if I need uh, healthcare advice, I just put the word beacon in front of whatever condition and treatment, and I know I'm going to find it usually uh, in SEO position number one. So Google even recognizes through that duplicate content, uh, canonical, you know, references carry that uh, we, it knows who the source is for that content. And if I put a branded keyword before it, beacon, it knows that I want it from beacon and it trusts that that's going to be um, you know, where that content is being delivered. Did I answer the question? I believe so, yes. Yeah. The good old canonical question, that's a good yeah. one. I think it's a good point though, because when you think about the data uh, lives externally, it lives within Mayo and Mayo is updating it uh, all the time. So yes. anytime there are any updates, so then you're, you're ingesting it via API 
But then if you're just pulling it through and then not doing anything with it, and you're just trying to, you know, post it by, you know, collaborating with, mm -hmm. you know, your provider data and matching it to the specialties and all of that different element. I think that, that that's a big issue that if you're not adding the canonical references, then there could be some detrimental effects to your SEO as opposed yeah. to the positive effects that you're seeing. Yes. And, and Headless really helps you um, in that regard with canonical references, but it also makes sure that you're not competing or cannibalizing your own SEO. I mean, if you were to ask me, what does Headless mean? And I, I too, that reference is um, hard, hard to grasp for the first time you hear it, but it just means no more, no more copy paste. If you're copying and pasting content, you're not headless. I mean, back in the day when we were creating pages manually and coding them, you know, you would copy and paste content all the time because you wanted to put, you know, information on another page. We all then got CMSs and that helped us, you know, manage that. So we weren't copying and pasting all the time. But this now headless means you're using data as your source. You're you're not creating content, pasting it on pages and, and creating pages independently. You're creating frameworks that utilize data. And when you do that, you're not duplicating, you're not uh, cannibalizing SEO, you're managing content. So let's say uh, gastritis you know, conditions change or treatments change for that particular uh, condition. Uh, we don't have to worry, okay, uh, gastritis change, where do we have all the content that we've copied and pasted for gastritis? It could be thousands of pages. It's one place in the knowledge graph. You go in, you change, you change a keyword, you change some content, and instantly through, uh, through your entire omni-channel, uh, that content is updated. This happens a lot for us. This happens when we have new procedures or new technologies you know, we're talking about um, brand names, a particular hardware, or surgical tools that we want to associate with particular specialists or surgeons, or topics that come up uh, in, in media and technology and society. We want to be able to quickly generate content or quickly expose uh, great access points for people to consume that content and convert to an appointment, not having to oh, just clone this page or do a save as. I, I think healthcare is finally getting that. Um, those logos that I showed early on in the presentation, they've been doing that for such a long time. Things change it so fast and technology is, is the growth of technology is what we say is asymptotic. So it's just continuing to move at the pace of we don't even understand and i think to be able to update in one place and then update everywhere so that you're not hunting around anymore i mean healthcare can't afford to update everywhere by doing it in a one by one way anymore it just I, we're moving too fast and the consumer has too much choice they could go somewhere else if they can't find what they need or if they're finding inaccurate information too yeah, that, I mean, you and I've talked about this uh, in, in many situations that every page should, you know, function like a search results, mm -hmm. you know, because someone has searched for it, you know, yeah. long ago, some of the early search engines were directories, right? I mean, you could talk about this at length, <laughs> uh, where humans were curating content and saying, well, here's a list of links, right? Here's my quick links or hot links to, you know, various things uh, that died out fast because then, you know, the, the search engines came and then Google perfected this and has owned the industry for a long time. Uh, we have to think and behave that way too. We can't create a dermatology page for Carrie to find, you know, in 2018 and post that and hope that page lives, you know, on and is able to, you know, uh, support patients who are seeking that. Now we need to create a headless framework with structured data that said, if anyone from anywhere is looking for dermatology related conditions, treatments, or providers, we need to, you know, have the best content that match them with that topic and convert them into an appointment. So, you know, so when we talk, <laughs> there's someone saying Yahoo, I was going <laughs> to, <That's laughs> uh, 
when when uh, the team when we talked about this in some of the early stages, Carrie, in that that like history slide that I talked about, uh, one of the ways that we sort of articulated the strategy was saying uh, Mayo Mayo shouldn't Mayo pages shouldn't just be content; they should be search results. So if you look at those gastritis pages, it's as if you've searched Google. It's as if you've searched for gastritis and here's your faceted structured data that shows here's your topic here's your providers here's your locations uh, and and from this particular page you don't have to you know click here to learn more or go somewhere else you are booking your appointment right then and there uh, from this interface to to that appointment just like google behaves where it gives you its structured data. It says, here's the results from our knowledge graph. Now buy that product, get that trap, you know, get that uh, ticket to Hawaii, uh, whatever the situation may be. So uh, it's kind of behaving very similarly to, to, how, uh, to how Google has done it. Yeah, don't create a new wheel. You can just recreate the wheel, you know it worked. And yeah. also I think you reduce the friction for your patients and your consumers when they finally get to you too. I think by saying click to learn more, you're introducing one friction point. And then you know they, if they have to keep on clicking or if they find that it's a like my dermatology example, if you have to go through pain, then there's a far less likelihood that you're going to actually book as that patient. You're going mm -hmm. to go, it's a lot easier. Yep. Shall we move to the next slide? Yes. You're, so here's here's just some examples as we're looking at our average position and you know we are you can see in the infographic right here that I have we are if you know your geography of the United States you know we are in Indiana and, and Michigan uh, we but we do see nationwide that we've improved uh, our trends for over the 5,000 pages and you can see we're making significant gains in our ranks in one and five you can see the average position is going down which is good like golf and this strategy, this each strategy and structured uh, uh, content has generated, uh, I mean, the last time we pulled this stat, over 100 million blue links in Google uh, for great content. So now the takeaway slide. Uh, so for those of you uh, who are, who are uh, attending, these are the takeaways. It's if you're considering this, you know, learn to track SEO, make sure that you have your analytics, make sure that you understand, you know, your scoreboard and your scorecards. How are you going to know, you know, if you're making a difference? Uh, really prepare for a knowledge graph by committing to data as a source. You know, this is the technical and the non-technical. We partnered so closely internally with our IT slash IS teams, our marketing team, our communications team, we created persistent work groups to talk about how do we prioritize data. We changed our behaviors in terms of, you know, how do we manage names and phone numbers and keywords and content to structure. Uh, we have persistent teams that are meeting, talking about how do we optimize our knowledge graph. So it's not just a matter of getting a new technology and plugging it in. It's also behavioral. Uh, get a design system. Uh, shout out to people on the call. I know you were a part of that creation. Uh, we had the foresight years ago and the team and the talent to create a design system that we weren't worrying about designing every single page. This is, you know, how, how we used to do things where you would design and copy and paste in all our content. A design system gives you a way visually to have a language that presents, that prepares you for dynamic content. Uh, use or build a content a API. So I'm going to answer the question. If you can't have Mayo content, how do you Get your expertise. You can create your own endpoints. You know you can use open source. That was in one of Carrie's slides uh, to create content and use it. Uh, create structured content from from your own API. Uh, put the data on the page. Track your clicks through the funnel. You know make sure that you are reviewing the trends with marketing and your CRM teams. We have a precision marketing team that works on this and gets gets content from this, and we we look at that. Uh, AI, we already talked about. And then if you need to prioritize it, make it easy. This thing, you know, headless can generate your pages. 
uh, focus on your conversions, and last but not, certainly not least, uh, build in multi-language support such as Spanish. We're doing that now and seeing dramatic uh, double-digit uh, gains percentages in our support for Spanish speakers and using the same methods. Um, so it's it, it's proof there that the headless approach uh, can help you uh, sustain that. Right on time. Right on time, Matt. So now we'll go to some Q&A. Daniel, are you handling the Q&A? Yep. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions here. So I think we'll start with this one. Um, how easily does the structured data translate across different domains and subdomains, mainly you know, hospital.org and doctors.hospital.org is a core example. Uh, I don't know if Carrie, if you want to start with that or. I don't think I can necessarily answer that. Uh, Matt, can you answer that? And if we can't, then we'll get an answer for you. It sounds like Matt, you can. Yeah, uh, it's cross domain. Uh, that's omni-channel knows no limits, knows no bounds to subdomains and domains, even in, uh, you know, formats. So uh, the content that you're seeing from Mayo, we utilize in several different subdomains. Uh, we use it in our slash library, and we're also able to query it and create small, composable, structured pieces of content that are dynamically driven based on, you know, the page that you're on. Uh, so that is that question really is sort of the uh, the definition of what headless can do is you stop thinking about um, domains and pages and you think about experiences and how those experiences can support the conversion of uh, from Dr. Google uh, to your doctor. And hopefully that answered the question. Terrific. Thank you, Matt. Um, I guess I'll give this one to you as well. Um, how are you tracking things like appointment requests, initiations, while still following the new HIPAA requirements for web analytics? See you at the next conference is what I would say. <laughs> like, see you in Las Vegas. Um, yeah, that's that's a really it's a really big. Um, big topic and we, we benefited uh, I benefited as being a representative uh, at, at the conference in Austin where this is talked about and there are you know this is a, a very important uh, topic I think uh, what we're doing is first is knowledge and awareness we're focusing very clearly on uh, the information that was presented back in December and and what that meant we're also looking at what the AHA has responded to, and I think as recently as May, talking about uh, how restrictive some of those new guidances and, and compliance issues are for healthcare providers. We care about the topic, we talk about it. Uh, we, like everyone else uh, on this call, went through the GA4 conversion that Google forced, enforced, uh, oh gosh, uh, 10 days ago, uh, in our very, um, conscious and, and very deliberate in tracking uh, what it what we do what we do uh, track with analytics and what we're what we don't. But I would say this is a really hot topic of which I'm not I'm not a, a legal uh, expert, but I think this is something that is very important, uh, you know, to us and to our industry. Carrie, any any reflections you would have on that? No, I mean, I defer to the organizations because you all are dealing with this. Um, you know, you're at the the front lines of it. I think there's a lot of confusion right now. And if you're not able to track anything, then I feel like the, at least from a conversion standpoint, you we've gone back then 20 years, 15 years, just to say, what is the value of what we're doing to try to acquire a new patient? So trying to figure this out. I know of a number of organizations who are really progressive in thinking about this and trying to work with their legal teams. So 
uh, we can, whoever asked that question, we can go back and forth on maybe making some recommendations there. But I feel like everyone's basically in the same position as, a, as thinking about what should we do and how should we do it. So um, Matt, it could change for you tomorrow, basically. You never know what your yeah. legal team is going to say to yeah. you. You yeah. have to you have to operate within the bounds of what you're allowed to do at this point in time. Yeah, and the, it was very thought provoking at the conference in, in Austin and you know, have made lots of connections there. And there are experts at Beacon who, who, you know, represent this and, and who study it very closely. What I will say from, from our, our link in the chain for the organization, which is digital, um, and, and we partner and, and very closely collaborate with marketing, uh, we're, we're prepared and we're ready uh, to ebb and flow with this. Uh, we're talking today about the effect of uh eat for SEO, but really we're doing, we're doing eat for SEO to generate appointments. So if it, if it results that the compliance means that we are, that we lose uh, the ability to track and have the analytics, like Carrie said, that every other industry is doing. Uh, and if, and if it does set us back, we're prepared uh, to comply, obviously. And, and we do comply uh, to have the analytics be uh, the bookable appointments and to look at, you know, the results for appointments uh, in other systems that show the impact of SEO on, a, on appointment initiations. We would lose a big piece in the middle that shows that conversion in the funnel. Um, but we put as much effort into our business information or analytics on the back end uh, as we do on the front end. And that's where we would go to get this type of information if we had to had to go without it. Great. Thank you both for that. Um, Matt, uh, looking for a little bit maybe more detail on the knowledge graph. Um, is this something you just create on the web pages similar to like a Google knowledge graph? Uh, is that how you guys did this? So I'll, I'll quickly intro this and then Carrie, I think you you would like to, to talk about what is a knowledge graph because um, uh, that, that is that is the uh, a knowledge graph for us is uh, we we use Yext for for that. It is I care, one of Carrie's slides. I think shows the structured content that really uh, illustrates uh, the relationships of data and structured data. Uh, but what we've done is moved our uh, our focus on how we manage content in the past, which was really in CMSs, and shifted it almost entirely head in, into a headless strategy into utilizing a knowledge graph, which is we use Yext as our platform. So I think Carrie, the question is, you know, what is Yext? Yeah, um, actually I can show you, I think this is the question here. It's, whoops, here it is right here. Um, it's basically, this is the encapsulation of, if you can see my, um, my cursor or my pointer here, it's, what Matt and team have done is they've stored their data in Yext, so the platform itself, and built the relationships within that. So this Dr. Ab Abu Zafar Arif, who is a gastroenterologist, he's in the knowledge graph, and his specialty is also in the knowledge graph. And he's then related to the gastritis content that's coming in through the Mayo API, so the content API. So this is showing basically how to take that knowledge graph and its relationships and actually putting that information into one place on a single page that then can have the SEO juice and the schema tagging on the back end and all of that structured data sent to the search engines. So I would say that's the best use case in the concept of how to think about Yext as a platform, but then what are the ways, like you were saying, Matt, um, think about the experiences. Your whole hypothesis was, can we build a better experience where we can actually drive more appointments? We, we can reduce the friction, which was my, those are sort of my words that I'm putting into your mouth. But how do we make sure that we can give everybody what they need when they get to us on the first try? And how do we leverage all of the different data points that we've already built on the back end through the Yext platform that then we can also extract data, pull it into the platform, and then send it out? So that's the that's the vision or the use case that could then provide those benefits. 
So um, I think that answers the question from that perspective of the concept of the knowledge graph and then putting it on two pages. And if not, feel free to write it back in. Perry, may I add to that? Yeah, of course. The previous slide 20 gives a glimpse of the Yext interface. So if the, uh, if the person who asked that question is wondering what does the interface look like, this is what the knowledge graph, how it presents so on the back end. And I think there's also another slide, which was uh, number 10, slide 10. I really think hits home uh, what a knowledge graph is. I mean, remember back back when we looked at single pages and we managed things manually and then CMS became you know, the topic and you had to think about dynamic database driven content. This is the next you know, huge leap forward in that where it's your CMS plus APIs where data may be shipped to you from many different sources. You know, in that example that we use with Yext, Yext helps us manage the knowledge, not only in what we're shipping out to Google uh, and how we're managing individual listings and providers and location data, but it also has content coming into it from Mayo and other source systems, directories, uh, where it's managing content. That gastritis page that we were showing in that example uh, has content from multiple sources in it, and that content and those APIs all uh, convene in, uh, in the knowledge graph. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. You know it better because you know all of the ins and outs and where the APR, APIs are and what data you have in and for your own internal use case. So thank you for that question, by the way. Yeah, that was a great question. All right. And uh, I think we've got time for one more. Um, so I'll <clears throat> go with, uh, what's the best technical structure to represent specialty care within a hospital location? Uh, nested locations, departments, or maybe something else. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that in some of the uh, the, the questions that were submitted in advance, and uh, I think it, I, I think it needs a little more context. But I think what I'm hearing is uh, a question of technical structure. Could be we could go tech stack, or we could go information architecture. And I, I circled this one and I was talking about how, you know, how would I answer this? And I would say, here's my thoughts. And, and to the person who asked this, I have, I have some notes. Uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because search. If search is what's going to be used to get to your site and search is going to be used on your site. Uh, if someone's looking for a specialty care, uh, you just want to make sure that they can that specialty care can be found. It can be found either on site, off site, through SEO, through you know precision marketing. That if someone is looking for a topic, a specialty, specialties are usually can you know related to diseases, conditions, treatments that your headless architecture, your knowledge graph is making those connections for you. And if it's, you know, you also may be interested in or doing other relation uh, management that uh, uh, that can help people find it. Now, how we do it with our, with our site is uh, natural language processing, and, and which is a, a function of AI, uh, helps us fill those gaps. So if you're on a page a, a, about gastritis, gastritis could be the condition you have. It could be uh, related to many different things. I mean, you want to go talk to a gastroenterologist uh, to ask those questions into you know, a healthcare provider, but it also could be related to another specialty. This happens a lot with surgeries. Uh, it happens a lot in uh, service lines such as uh, cancer and HVS. Uh, I think the technical structure is a knowledge graph. <laughs> it really is. Uh, and the relationships there. Uh, I also say there's a non-technical piece to it. And I'll say this very quickly, how you organize, how you behave. We created a work group called Data Stewardship that meets every Monday at two o'clock. 
we talk about data structures, technical structures. We make sure that we are uh, informing and integrating our data into systems that are going to make sense for our for our patients and our consumers. And, and that helps us make sure that the right specialties, you know, are presented or associated or are related to the surgery center or the hospital or the urgent cares or whatever the situation may be. Well, what do you think, Carrie? Amen. That's what I think. <laughs> You're the expert on it, but I think that uh, that definitely. What you said before, where you think about experiences, I think that's what um, the mind shift needs to be. It's it's you already have a foundation of data. So if you think about like how do you use it or how to structure it in a particular way, you have to create internally with your own institutions that you have to create your governance strategies and your understanding of that. But at the end of the day, it has to be, where's your foundation? And then what experiences can you build off of it? So that's all I would say to that. Yeah, and in, in, in your slide deck, and I know we're, we're gonna get the wrap it up here. I, I'm sorry if I jumped in too quickly. It's that uh, slide 15 in the slide deck that talks about those relationships. It's you know, if they're searching for a physician, make sure that physician is also related to locations and services and treatments. If they're searching for a treatment, make sure, you know, likewise and so on. It's it's a network and it's really, by definition, I, I think it is a knowledge graph. That's the technical structure. All right. Well, thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of our time. I'm sure the audience joins me in thanking Matt and Carrie for sharing their experience and expertise with us today. Thanks also to our audience for carving out time to join us for this important conversation. Please note that if you've asked a question that we weren't able to get to, we will do our best to get a response to you. And we'll also be sending out a link to the webinar recording in the next couple of days, so be on the lookout for that. Finally, be sure to give us your feedback by completing the evaluation survey as you exit the webinar. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars, or as Matt mentioned earlier, the Healthcare Marketing and Physician Strategy Summit next April in Las Vegas. Check the forum website, www.healthcarestrategy.com for details. That concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.